All right, hello everyone. We are um, going to be talking about section 3.1, which is properties of linear functions and linear models. Properties of linear functions. and linear models. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so in this section, um, we're going to actually go over a bunch of things which are probably relatively familiar. Maybe not, but if they are, um, just bear with it. A linear function. The root word of linear, of course, is line. So we are talking about a line. And because it's a function, we're going to use function notation, which is f of x, which we know is basically the same as y, equals mx plus b. We've pretty much seen this. We've actually been using it a little bit before. y equals mx plus b, mx plus b. m is, oops. Sorry, I'm having a hard time with the erasing part here. There we go. M is the slope, and B represents the y-intercept. So the B value represents where the graph crosses the y-axis, and M represents the slope. Functions which are not linear are just said to be nonlinear. Should kind of make sense. All right, so how would we graph a linear function? Well, we've done this before. We'll just kind of sketch one real quick. So if we have f of x equals, I don't know, let's say negative 3x plus 7. If we wanted to graph that, we know that the y-intercept is 7. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So approximately right there would be your y-intercept. So we put a dot there, and then we can use the slope to graph another point, because all we need are two points to create a line. So let me go ahead and create 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So we can go, um, using the slope of negative 3, that means that we're going to have a rise of negative 3, which is kind of counterintuitive. A rise of negative 3 means we're actually going to go down 3. And since it's 3, technically it's never negative 3 over 1, we're going to have a fall of 3, 1, 2, 3, and then write 1 unit. And that would be another point on the line. So our change and our y values, here let's draw the line first. So the line is going to look something like that, and then it keeps on going this way. So what we have is we have a change of our y values. The y changes right there. That distance right there is the y change, represented by a triangle y. The triangle means it's a Greek letter delta, actually, and it actually means the change of y. And then we have a change of our x values, which goes from this point to that point. So I'll kind of put a thing there. That is our change of x, delta x. Okay, so you have a change of y and a change of x. And you've probably seen this, or you may have seen it, maybe not. You can also see this as the change of y over the change of x. That's how you figure out what the slope is. Again, also said maybe as rise over run. All that stuff just um, is basically M. It's the slope. All right, so that's one way to graph a line. Again, plug in the y-intercept first, then use the slope to find a second point, and you have the graph of your line. How else could we necessarily identify a linear function? Well, considering that what we're looking for is a constant rate of change. We are looking for that slope 
to be the same all through the line. The entire line is going to have a negative 3 slope in our case, on our specific case that we did here. But let's say that maybe I'm giving you a table of values or something like that. So let's take a look at what it what might look like if I gave a table of values here. So and this is the exact same function. So if this is your x values, and then over here are your f of x values, which is the same thing as y, which in our case was the same thing as negative 3x plus 7. Let's just start listing some x values. So we can list maybe, we could plug in negative 2, we could plug in negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and we could keep going, but we're going to stop there. If we plug in negative 2, you should see that if you plug in negative 2 into your equation, you would get negative 3 times negative 2, which is 6, plus 7 is 13. If you plug in negative 1, you're going to get 3 plus 7, which is 10. If you plug in 0, you're just going to get 7. If you plug in 1, you're going to get 4. If you plug in 2, we'll get 1. If you plug in 3, we'll get... Um, was it negative 2? Yeah, negative 2 it looks like. So this is how you can determine from a table of values that something is linear. What you're going to look for is what is the change in y based upon a constant change of x? Meaning, is x changing by the same amount? Well, that's pretty easy to see. Every time, x is increasing by 1. Right? From negative 2 to negative 1, that's an increase of 1. From negative 1 to 0, that's an increase of 1. And so on. Is y also changing constantly? Is it the same change for every constant change of x? So let's check it. From 13 to 10, it looks like we are going down 3. From 10 to 7, we are going down 3. 7 to 4, down 3, and so on. Every single one has a constant change of negative 3. So our y is changing by negative 3, while our x is changing by 1. Delta y over delta x. Change of y over the change of x, which of course just simplifies to negative 3. That matches the slope that was in our original equation. So if all we were do, um, if all we were given was a set of um, points or a chart that had a set of values on it, we could determine whether this thing was linear by looking at the differences. We just need to see how is x changing, how is y changing, and then you could figure out whether it's a linear function. So really what you're looking at here is an average rate of change of some kind the average rate of change of a linear function is delta y over delta x. All right, let's try, I don't know, let's try something where maybe it's not quite as easy because we've got some decimals or something in it. So I'm just going to give us a chart. And, I don't know, maybe the chart represents, this part right here might represent time. And this part, part over here might represent, like, population. So, let's see, the times are going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The populations, and we're going to, just so you have an idea, it's not like a population of people, this is going to be some kind of a, um, I don't know, some kind of a substance or something that we're going to measure in grams. And the population is at time 1, 0 0.09. So maybe this is like a, I don't know, a population of bacteria growth or something like that. Who knows? Um, then 0.12, then 0.16, then 0.22, 0.29. So again, is it a constant rate of change? Do the times constantly change by the same amount? It certainly looks like that, right? They're all increasing by one. That one's pretty easy to see. 
Now let's check the populations. The population between 0 0.09 and 0 0.12 is a growth of 0 0.03. Between 0.12 and 0.16 is a growth of 0 0.04. If we're just looking to figure out whether this is linear or not, we're done. Because this is not the same growth from every between every y value. As a matter of fact, it's going to be different for most of these things. What's the next one like point? 06 or something like that and we could keep going but there's really no need to do so so this one here does not have a constant rate of change it's different so this would be non-linear it's a non-linear function and that's really all you have to do you just have to see what the differences are as long as they are, it's got to be constant for both your X and your Y, or in this case, it was our times and our populations. This is not going to be a linear uh, model. Okay, so let's go ahead. We're going to add a different page here. Hopefully that one made sense. This next one I think is much easier. As long as you have somewhat of an understanding of what we're looking at here when it comes to slope, especially if you're given the equation, We want to determine, simply by looking at the equation, if a linear function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. And this one's actually pretty easy to do. So we're going to get four of them here. A will be f of x equals 5x minus 2. B is going to be g of x equals negative 2x plus 8. C will be s of t equals 3 fourths t minus 4, and d will be h of z equals 7. So four different linear functions. All we want to determine is if they are increasing, decreasing, or constant. Now remember, it's a line, so whatever it's doing, it's going to do the same thing all the time. It's either going to keep going up, keep going down, or remain constant. Pretty easy to tell. The giveaway is the slope. All you're looking for is what is the number that's being multiplied times your x. In this first one, the slope is 5, and that is a positive 5. Positive indicates increasing. That is a positive slope or a positive rate of change. Therefore, this one is increasing all the time. Likewise, in g of x in part b, we're looking at the slope. The slope is negative 2, which means that it has a negative rate of change all of the time. So therefore, it is a decreasing function. Okay, it really doesn't make any difference whether these things are fractional. It's still just the sign of the slope. That is a positive 3 fourths. Therefore, it is increasing. Doesn't make any difference if it's a fraction or a decimal or anything else. It's just the sign. And then in part D, what you should notice there, first of all, it's H of Z. Well, there are no Z's or any variables, for that matter, on the right-hand side of the equal sign. It's just 7. 7 is a number, and it's always 7. When something is always the same value, that means it is constant. It is not changing. There's no variable to have it change. So this one would be constant. And a constant function, if you remember from the graphing, is basically horizontal. So that would be a function which goes through the y value of 7, and it always stays 7. That's how you can determine whether a linear function is increasing, decreasing, or constant just by looking at it. It's all determined by the slope. <clears throat> okay. So now let's look at finding the 0.
find the zero of a linear function. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing we want to think about is does f of x equals negative one half x plus two have a zero? And here is the quick and easy answer to this. This is a line. All lines are going to have a zero. And remember that a zero means when it crosses the x-axis. All lines are going to have a zero as long as they are not constant. Every other one is going to have a zero. So basically, you just can't have f of x equals 7 or f of x equals 2 or f of x equals 4, something like that any other line will cross through the x-axis somewhere. So the answer to this question is undoubtedly yes, because it is not constant. Basically, it has to have a slope other than zero, and this one has a slope of negative one-half. So yes, it will have a zero or an x-intercept. Again, that's the way you think about a zero. So part B then says, if it does, find the zero. So now we want to find the zero. Again, remember that a zero is an x-intercept. If it's an x-intercept, that means that y is equal to zero. f of x is the same thing as y. So we're going to substitute zero in for f of x and then set it equal to our equation here, our line, and solve for x. So we can subtract 2 on both sides of the equation. <clears throat> and then because we have a negative 1 half being multiplied times our x, we can either divide both sides by negative 1 half, or we can multiply both sides by the reciprocal of negative 1 half, which is negative 2. So I'm going to choose to multiply both sides by negative 2, which is going to give us 4 equals x. So the 0 is going to be at x equals 4. If we need to, now that we know what the x-intercept is, I already know what the y-intercept is because that's the b value, I can graph the function. So we can just do a really quick sketch of that. Let's see, the y-intercept is 2. The x-intercept is 4. That's really all I need to put on my graph because I only need two points. I've got two points. Let's create the line. That goes through those two points. Kind of missed my point. Better if I used a ruler, but I didn't. All right, and the last thing is something that we hadn't talked about yet. Let's say we want to solve for f of x is greater than 0. Or basically, we want to figure out all the x values, excuse me, all the, um, yeah, all the x values that are going to have the function or the y value greater than 0. Well, if you look at the graph, you can kind of visually see it. When all the y values are greater than 0, it's in this range right here. It's all of these values of the graph. So basically, as long as x is, it looks like less than negative 4, excuse me, less than 4, the y values will be greater than 0. So how would we actually go about figuring that out? Well, if we want f of x to be greater than 0, what we want is the function which represents f of x, negative 1 half x plus 2, to be greater than zero. And then we can solve that for x. And we should get exactly what I just said. So if we subtract two on both sides, and then we multiply by the reciprocal once again, which is going to be negative two, if you multiply the inequality by a negative value, the sign will change, um, change directions. So we will get that x is less than four. 
So for f of x to be greater than 0, x must be less than 4. Okay, we've got one more thing to talk about. We're actually going to put this into an application, so I'm going to start a new page. <clears throat> this specific application is going to deal with supply and demand. <clears throat> so supply is based upon the amount of a product that a company is willing to make for the sale at a given price. The demand is how much consumers are willing to purchase at that given price. So if I was giving you some kind of a supply function, whatever this thing is, I don't know, maybe it's, you know, we're selling cell phones or something like that. I don't know. Or maybe it's the cost of the cell, phone, cell phones per month, something like that. Um, whatever the situation is. Let's say that the supply is 30p minus 900, where p is going to represent the price. So p is the price of the cell phone. But the demand function at a given price is negative 7.5p plus 2,850. The first thing you might want to know is, what is the equilibrium price? Or, what is the price where the supply and the demand are going to be the same? So the equilibrium, e is it? Equal, equal, I think it's equilibrium. The equilibrium is where supply equals demand. Basically, they're equal. So if we want to figure out what the equilibrium price is, we're going to take the two equations and we're going to set them equal to each other. So we're going to have the supply, which is 30p minus 900 equals the demand, which is negative 7.5p plus 2,850. And if I want to figure out where these two things are equal, I'm going to solve for p, and then that'll be the price. So to solve for p, I'm going to get all the p's to the left here. We're going to add 7.5p to both sides. And that should give us 37.5p minus 900 equals 2,850. I'm going to then add 900 to both sides. So we get 37.5p equals um, 2850 plus 900 is 3750. <laughs> that works out quite well, actually. To solve this, we're going to divide both sides by 37.5. When we divide by 37.5, we end up with p equals 100, which means that the supply is going to equal the demand when the price of the cell phone or whatever this thing is that we've got is 100. And if you're not sure about that, if you're like, well, how do I actually know that? If you plug the 100 back into both the supply and the demand function, it should not only give you the same value, that value would be the actual, um, would be the actual amount. So you could plug that in and just see. Okay, if we wanted to know maybe when the supply exceeded the demand, <coughs> well, if you want to know when the supply is greater than the demand or exceeds the demand, then you would just change all the equal to symbols that we have into greater than symbols and solve. So honestly, it would be all the same steps. You would just end up with P is greater than 100. So if the price is greater than 100, you're going to probably have more supply than demand, which means you're actually going to probably end up with a surplus of stuff. You're going to have stuff left over. Contrasting that, if you were to sell for less than $100, you would end up with 
more of a demand than you have supply and then people would get mad because they don't have enough cell phones to, to go around. If we were going to actually sketch that, which we're probably not going to do just because these numbers are really big, you would just sketch each one of those um, linear functions and then what you would see is that there is an equilibrium point which is exactly at p equals 100. <clears throat> and that would pretty much tell you, um, again, at a price of 100, you would sell this many. Supply and demand would be exactly the same. I think it comes out to 2100 if you plug it in, but you could check that to make sure. All right, so that is section 3.1. I'll come back with a second video um, that might be multiple videos for 3.2 so that they're not exceptionally long.